I think everybody knows somebody, but not everybody knows everybody. So quickly, I'll say I'm Will Cross. I work at NC State University, and I'm, I get to hang out with the Rolling Stones cohort a little bit. Uh, Jeannie and Michael, do you want to quickly say hi as well? Sure. I'm Jeannie Hoover, and I'm at East Carolina University, and I work with the Doors cohort. And I am Michael Whitchurch. I am at Brigham Young University, and I work with the Platters cohort. Great. Thanks, everybody. So we're really excited to spend the next hour or so talking about this idea of open pedagogy, the what, why, and the how of it. Um, I'm going to kick us off, and then I'm going to let the other folks jump in as well. But before we start talking about uh, sort of what we think open pedagogy is and how it might apply to the work that you're doing, we wanted to start with kind of a framing question. And that's a question that you can answer out loud or in the chat if you want to, or it can also just be something that you think on and chew on a little bit. Um, but the question is, what was your favorite course as a student? What's a course that you took that maybe it changed the trajectory of your career, or maybe it just is is a really warm memory and it's something that changed the way you think about the world. What, what, what was the course that you took that you think, oh, that one, they got it right. That was special. And take maybe 15 seconds or so to think about that. As I say, feel free to share, or if not, just to think about that course. I hear some awesome ones in the chat, everything from preservation to mythology. Um, the 1600 course sounds really cool. Russian history, medieval culture. You can hear the sort of the diversity of topics and approaches, uh, music appreciation, all these different things. And as you think about that course, think about whether it was queer literature or intermediate drawing too. What was it about that course that made it your favorite? Um, and some of the things that we've heard in the past that, that I, you all may be saying in chat now as well, or the thing about that course that made it their favorite were, these are some quotes we've seen in, in past uh, sort of versions of this conversation. I felt like my work mattered. I saw myself in the materials. The instructor cared about my success and my well-being. Um, I made connections and built a for portfolio. I have a great story to tell about the experience for myself. Some of my favorite classes are completely unrelated to what I do in my day-to-day -day life, but, but just experientially, they were really incredible. Uh, those sorts of things. And I see in the chat, yeah, some more examples as well. Thank you for sharing those. This last one is, is one I wanted to highlight for just a second, this idea that I've never had a class like that before, the first time a professor did this thing or tried that out. And I want to suggest to you that all of these quotes are quotes that often align with or apply to open pedagogical practices in different ways. The rest of the hour, we're going to be talking about ways to make the work matter that help students see themselves in the materials that they're engaging with and that sort of thing. And in particular, what, I, what I'm excited to do with open pedagogy sort of writ large is to move from, I've never had a class like that before to the next question, why aren't all my classes like that? Why, right? Every class should be like that favorite class. We should learn something from that special moment, from that attitude, from that approach, from that way of doing and being and welcoming people into the space and sort of going from there. Um, open pedagogy is a way to build those favorite courses, um, which can be useful to a person building a course, to a person taking a course, and just for the way we think about education writ large. So, so thanks for humoring us in that little sort of side, side street down favorite courses. I'm going to shut up now and let Michael talk a little bit about what open pedagogy is and what it means to be open, and then we'll go from there. So one of the things that is actually often debated about in the open world, and it, it's not necessarily just OER, but OA, open science, what does open mean? So if you'll go to the next slide, uh, I just put a chat or yeah, a, a link in the chat. If you'll go to that, tell me what does open mean to you? And just start typing something in there. It could be one word, it could be multiple words, but that word open, what does it mean? And to write something on Padlet, simply double click and you can start typing. I like some of these that are coming in. 
easily accessible, freedom, no barriers, shareable, I like that possibilities, accessible without barriers, accessibility is important, transparent, uh, that's another word that comes out, available to all. Yeah, so all of these, if you notice, <laughs> open doesn't just mean one thing. It can mean a variety of different things, uh, not trapped in one of those commercial modules that makes courses so miserable. <laughs> Whoever wrote that, yes. Uh, so many different possible definitions of open. So on the next slide, uh, you'll see some, well, actually, before we go on to that, uh, I actually wanted to talk about some of the discussion the the terms we equated with open. You've got free, equitable, accessible, broadly available, honest, transparent. So all of these are definitions of open, what it means to be open. So how do we apply that to this phrase, open pedagogy? We assume we understand what pedagogy is, the, the act of teaching and learning. It's how you get the information to students so that they do learn it. On the next slide, we have a, a, a video from Rajiv Giangiani, who is, has been working in the OER field. And if you have an opportunity to read about his experience, he talks about his transformation from a faculty member through the steps to becoming an OER advocate very strongly on his campus. So let's go ahead and take a listen to this video. Thumbs up, great. Open pedagogy is an access-oriented commitment to learner-driven education. It's also the process of using tools and building architectures for learning that allow students to shape the public knowledge commons of which they are a part. Open pedagogy might look like co-creating course policies, rubrics, or even schedules of work with students, or replacing traditional course assignments in which only the instructor may see the student's work with assignments that have a larger audience, impact, and legacy. This could involve students writing or editing articles in Wikipedia, writing op-ed pieces instead of another research essay, creating brief instructional videos instead of giving another classroom presentation, or annotating, updating, or even authoring open textbooks. To explore a diverse set of examples of open pedagogy in practice, visit the Open Pedagogy Notebook. So I've had to listen to that video multiple times to understand everything he talks about because it is so dense what he's talking about. He gives some examples of what open pedagogy can be. He gives a definition of what it could be. But again, this is one person talking from his perspective. So we're gonna go into a little more about some attributes of open pedagogy, what, what open pedagogy could contain. And we're gonna turn it over to Will to take care of that. Great, thank you, Michael, and thank you for that great introduction. Yeah, open pedagogy is really exciting, but one of the frustrations when talking about open pedagogy is nobody's willing to give you sort of a concrete definition of what it is a lot of the time. In fact, they, they uh, several folks, including Rajiv and Robin DeRosa and others have said, we sort of resist definition. So instead of trying to give you a one size fits all definition for this thing, we thought we'd offer some different lenses for sort of ways to look at and think about what open pedagogy can be. Um, so I'll offer a few and then I'll ask, I'll invite you all to, to offer some more as well. You can see some of the attributes in this graphic here. It's about innovation, it's about connection, it's about generation and reflection and all these different things. So, so a few lenses as we think about what open pedagogy sort of might be in different contexts. And we'll start with kind of the, the foundational one or the fundamental one. And coming up on a decade ago now, I guess at this point, David Wiley writes this influential blog post where he says, uh, what we really wanna talk about is open enabled pedagogy. So think about open pedagogy, not in some sort of abstract, what does open mean man sense, but, but it's truly the stuff you can do with an open license. So from the perspective of that blog post, saying open pedagogy is saying, these are the pedagogical practices that are available, that are made possible by that 5R permission that's at the heart of open educational resources and open education more generally. Um, 
And, and Wiley presents this lens very much as sort of a hand in glove with OER themselves. He famously uses this colorful analogy that when you adopt an open educational resource, if you take the open resource, but only stick with your existing pedagogies, that's kind of like driving an airplane down the highway. Like it can do that, it'll get you there, but there's more you could be doing too with that airplane than just driving down the highway. So one way to think about open pedagogy is to say, what's the new stuff I can do? What are things that I can do with open that I couldn't do with closed or proprietary? That's what we mean when we say open pedagogy. A second way to think about what open pedagogy is, is by thinking about it in terms of sort of a constructivist pedagogy, an idea that this is pedagogy that's about engaging with the real world and the lived experiences of students. That open pedagogy is open in the sense that it opens the door for students to bring into the classroom their actual lived experiences and to build sort of in that space and in ways that engage with the stuff they're thinking about, the lives they're living and the priorities that they have. Um, that second way of thinking about open pedagogy is tremendously exciting to me uh, for a variety of different reasons, but this idea that education should mean something beyond a sort of artificial uh, come in and do what I tell you to do and I'll put a red letter on your paper and go away, right? So a constructivist lens is a second useful lens to bring to this conversation. And I, we've got a couple of examples here, um, engaging with the New York Times editorials as a sort of a lived experience thing, and then engaging with new um, modes and methods of communication. So A.D. Carson uh, famously wraps his dissertation. He's the first one in the US to do that, bringing in new ways of making meaning and sharing knowledge, sort of a constructivist lens on that work. The third is related to that, and that is a productive pedagogy. We invite students to come in and bring their whole selves and think about what's meaningful for them. And then the next step potentially is inviting them to do work that actually feeds back out into the world that makes the world a better place in some sense, right? So that, that sense of producing something, of doing something that's not just the throwaway assignment is often at the heart of the way people talk about open pedagogy. But the thing about open pedagogy that gets some people excited, certainly a lot of folks on my campus, is the sense that we are doing work that acts actually meaningful. And that's important for the people doing the work themselves because it feels different to do something other people are gonna see and might benefit from. Um, but it's also important for the larger open educational community to have a sense that we're all working together on a shared enterprise and work I do makes Jeannie's life easier and work Jeannie does makes Tanya's life easier and on and on and on as well, right? So the sort of the invitational constructivist stuff and then the sharing out productive stuff as sort of the one two dance step of open pedagogy. It's another lens, another way to think about this issue. Another way to think about why open pedagogy is sort of important and exciting is to recognize that open pedagogy is designed to be tailored and flexible. It's, it's the opposite of the sort of one size fits all approach that we've all had the experience with before and that I saw mentioned a couple times on the Padlet a few minutes ago. Um, I will not blow anybody's mind if I tell you that the average student is no longer 18 and upper class and a white guy and coming from a prep school and going into the professions, right? The average student is not any of those assumptions anymore. And so using materials that are one size fits all that are designed just for that one person misses out on good pedagogy for most of our students. So open pedagogy can also be understood in terms of pedagogy that is aligned with the different lived experiences and priorities and ideas of the students that are already engaged in higher education. And then the flip side of that one is a recognition that not only does one size fit all not work for everybody, it has tended historically to work better for certain people than for other people. So open pedagogy says we need to be tailored, we need to be flexible, and we need to do it in a way that recognizes the general inequities in our society and build a more just, a more equitable, and a more invitational version of pedagogy. Um, so not just one size fits all is bad, but what really works for everybody in ways that understand the lived experiences and realities of the people engaged in that stuff. That's the second sort of one, two dance of open pedagogy is the tailored and the equitable piece of that. And then finally, I'll say that the, the piece of open pedagogy that, that gets my faculty most excited when I talk with them about these issues is a sense that open pedagogy is authentic pedagogy. That I've talked so far about the way that open pedagogy serves students and creates a better experience for the students in the classroom. I think open pedagogy also is really important in the ways it, it brings in the full 
person and humanity of instructors and faculty into the classroom as well, right? Um, whenever I talk to faculty, we talk about this idea that like they could invent a robot that just reads out lesson plans and that kind of thing. But what students are really there for is for you. You're the expert that we brought in to talk about this issue. You spent 10, 20, 30 years or more learning about chemistry. Why did you do that? What got you excited about chemistry? If you can bring that part of yourself into the classroom as well and say, hey, students in my chemistry class, that's the periodic table, that's part of it. But also, this is why I get up in the morning excited to do this stuff. If you can bring that enthusiasm, if you can bring your whole self, that makes the pedagogy better. Um, it also, incidentally, sort of demonstrates the value of faculty members and maybe makes it harder to replace them with this silly professor in a box that we have on the screen here. So authentic pedagogy. And then the last one I wanna to point to is in the past couple of years, we've had a crash course in the importance of timely pedagogy, of a pedagogy that uses that flexibility, that focus on equity and doing work that matters in the world as a way to respond to the circumstances in which teaching and learning is happening. Um, and so for us, a lot of that has been conversations about COVID and about racial justice in different ways, but, but every year there's, there's something that's happening that we need to respond to in different ways. So, so this uh, graphic from BC campus I really like about, it talks about the way that OER and open pedagogy is sort of the, the perfect tool for addressing challenges brought on by COVID. Um, but I think central to open pedagogy as a body of practice is that ongoing responsiveness to what's happening in the world. What are the specific needs of students in this moment? What are the ways instructors can bring them whole self, their whole selves, all that sort of thing. So those are a set of lenses that might be helpful in uh, sort of articulating ways to think about what open pedagogy is, what it can mean for the people who are involved with it, and what it might mean on your campus as well. Uh, we've been pretty abstract so far, so I think now it's my chance to turn it over and again uh, be quiet um, and let somebody else talk about what it actually looks like in practice. So I'm going to do that now. All right, thank you, Will. And one thing to note, you will have access to these slides, so all of these the, the links on the slides, the, the videos, that whatever it is, you will have access to this. Uh, so you can go to all of these things. Will talked about the, the graphic on the last slide. You can go to that and delve deeper into what does it really mean and how does it apply to me? So in the real world, what does open pedagogy actually look like? So before we go on to the next slides, we would like you to let us know where you have seen effective and maybe not so effective attempts at open pedagogy. What, what is it you've seen on your campuses? What have you done? And feel free to unmute or chat, whatever works best for you. Give you a couple of minutes to think about that. While people are thinking, I'll, I'll just quickly uh, share a comment I heard from somebody that I've worked with on my campus, who after we spent a, a whole semester talking about open pedagogy said, so this is just a lot of the stuff I've already been doing with a new name. I've always been thinking about student agency and how to support this work in different ways. You're just putting a new umbrella on it. So I wanna suggest that even if you had never heard the phrase open pedagogy, and I can't imagine that's the case, you've probably seen some versions of it in action somewhere. Yeah, thank you, Will. I actually had a very similar experience with a business professor on my campus. I was talking to her about how she's involving the students in the, in the creation of the content for the course for the next semester. And I said, well, that's open pedagogy. And she said, wow, that's great. And in fact, hopefully she will agree to lead an open pedagogy. Let's see, they call it an interdisciplinary discussion group on my campus, which is awesome to get them involved in that way. So we've got a bunch of different chats coming in, uh, local history project shared with the genealogy center, students recommending sources. I like that group development of course content. Uh, let's see, next one. 
Oh, I love that, Teresa. So you actually, as a student, were able to participate in open pedagogy. That is awesome. Okay, Kyle created something. That's great. So you've seen this in your on your campus already, uh, which is excellent. And as participants in this, you now have all of this huge list of how can I encourage faculty to use open pedagogy. Now you've got these examples. We're going to go into a few other examples that discuss ways you can use open pedagogy, and they refer to a lot the different lenses Will talked about, how you can use those lenses practically in your experience. So the first one uh, is the Open Pedagogy Notebook. This was created, oh, and I've just forgotten who created it. Was this Robin? It's Robin and Rajiv working together, I believe. That's right, and Rajiv. This is a set of examples of how open pedagogy is used. And it delves into so many different possible ways of using open pedagogy. And it's one of the things that um, I've been talking to my cohort a lot about is, you know, you're creating this, this action plan, which is, oh, so awesome. Well, your action plan is going to be so different than anybody else's. And in the same way, open pedagogy is going to be so different from one faculty to the next. They may use the same concept. For example, uh, on the next one, we talk about using Wikipedia, but you can use Wikipedia how many different ways to encourage students to participate in their course development and in their knowledge development. That's really a key right there is how can we get the students engaged in the course more? Uh, we have a lot of talk about experiential learning. Uh, a lot of times they talk about, well, let's go in the field and let's do this, or let's create a scientific experiment or something like that. But open pedagogy is actually experiential learning. It is giving the students experiences that help them learn the concepts in the course. That's one of the powers of open pedagogy. Uh, so I actually have a question for Will or anybody else who knows, because it occurred to me, how would someone get something on the Open Pedagogy Notebook? Is the question like, how do they get access to it or? No, if, if someone participating here has a faculty ah. member who has an excellent example, how can they get that included? It, it actually just occurred to me this morning Yep, that's a great question. We, we've been uh, having that conversation locally. Um, I think you just have to email the folks there. I, I don't remember if there is a specific upload button or not, um, but I know we could reach out to Robin or Rajiv and ask them to upload it as well. Great question. So, well, yeah, so if you have examples, reach out to Rajiv or Robin. Now, one of the things that um, that I've had to get over especially when it comes to things that I'm just not all that sure about. Um, reach out to Robin and Rajiv. They are so, so willing to respond to you and help you and do whatever they can to help you through this experience, um, especially in this case related to open pedagogy. Any of these big names in the OER world actually don't believe themselves big names. <laughs> but they, they have such a wealth of experience, reach out to them. So let's go to the next slide and start talking about some of the examples we have listed here. And the ones you have are so, so good. Keep encouraging your faculty to do this. So contributing to the commons, teach with Wikipedia. Um, and on the next screen, it talks about Wikipedia edit-a-thons. What is it that you can do with this particular thing? Um, Dr. Crowther, assistant professor in history and sciences, et cetera, et cetera, encourages the students to participate in the Wikipedia articles. Wikipedia is one of the most powerful tools for information. Who is putting the information on there? 
if you have students doing that, and of course it has to be vetted and Wikipedia will vet it as well, but this is such a great opportunity for students to take a topic within their subject field and either write a new article or edit one, add more references, add more content, whatever it may be, they participate. And think of it down the line, a student five years from now looks at that article and says, I did that. Think of it as a personal, wow, people still believe in it, or it can actually add to a resume. I helped create this. Very powerful for them. Uh, the next example we have is engaging in the public conversation. Uh, this goes to tools that you can use. In this case, it's highlighting hypothesis. Um, and if you're not familiar with hypothesis, it is a, an, an excellent tool to encourage participation in the creation of content. It's a, an add into your browser that allows you to highlight content on a web page. And you can save it for yourself if you're just taking notes, or you can sh share it with the public. So the authors of the content can actually look at these resources, what you've typed in. Um, maybe you're just correcting a spelling error or a grammatical error. They want to know these things because it improves the content that they have developed. And therefore, it improves the educational opportunities of the students. And this is just one of the ways that you can engage in the public conversation, participating in the development of existing content. So another example on the next one, it's OER starter kit, open pedagogy. What are the learning, it has the learning objectives there? Participating in the creation of content for the course. And we've had examples of this already from people who have typed in students who are participating in the creation of content. My first introduction to this particular concept was when I talked to uh, David Wiley, it, the, the funniest story, really quickly. I met David Wiley at a pre-conference and <laughs> I didn't know he had been a professor at BYU and he was still adjunct. I had no idea that David Wiley, a name that everybody knows, was at BYU. And so I had a conversation with him. And what he did is he took a text for his course that was not focused exactly on what he wanted to teach because it didn't have the examples that he wanted. So he opened it to the students and said, okay, here's this chapter. We have examples, but they don't pertain really to what we're learning here. Find examples and put them in. So they adapted that text to fit their context. This is engaging in the public conversation. The next one, <laughs> critical use of commercial tools. And that word critical is critical. Uh, you can't just take YouTube and throw it on there. That doesn't do what you want when it comes to open pedagogy. You need to use it critically. So you're using uh, uh, videos or portions of videos that are encouraging uh, contribution to the content. You could use it also, have them create YouTube videos that can then be used in conjunction with course content. So many different ways. And there are plenty of commercial tools that you can use. YouTube is just one of the ones that a lot of people know. SoundCloud is another one if it's just audio. So many ways that you can use commercial tools to encourage participation for students. If we go to the next slide, this visualizing organic chemistry labs, one of the big things that faculty complain about, I shouldn't say complain, um, that they're concerned about is they don't have ancillary materials for the text that they choose to use. And it's a problem. They need this extra content for the learning experiences of the student. But in this particular case, this organic chemistry labs, faculty can use this in conjunction with a course or 
course content text that they're using for their course. And it's open. So we have so many of these tools that can join with content that you're already creating. And actually, I'm not sure if this is this commercial tool is open or not, but there are open, open materials that you can use. So, and the last slide is just to back to the open pedagogy notebook. I have scrolled through some of these examples and I find it so interesting to look at different ways that different faculty have used the same concept the same mode of, or the same lens for open pedagogy in such different ways. Encourage faculty to do that. Encourage them to think outside the box. How can I help students participate in the course? Get them active in the learning process instead of passive, the whole sage on the stage thing. So those are some examples that we've got. Um, and the examples you've shown so, so good that you are recognizing things already on your, uh, on your campus that have been happening. So keep participating, keep talking to faculty, and encourage faculty on your campus to talk to each other about how they're using open pedagogy, which is what I'm hoping to do with my interdisciplinary learning group. Now we're going to turn it over to Jeannie because she's going to bring us home with so what? Thank you, Michael. So we've had, um, Will and Michael have shared a lot of information about um, open pedagogy and how you can, the definitions of it, how we can um, apply it on a larger level. And I'm gonna take it down a little bit to how, what we can do um, as part of this program, as part of developing your OER program, what you can do, different levels that you can apply. Uh, to bring open pedagogy to your campus. Um, so I'm going to break it down kind of into three pieces of different ways that you can do it. And as we've seen from the chat, you know, we've had such amazing examples. Um, and I think they've all hit the different pieces that I'm about to talk about. Um, but if you could, well, don't, if you mind, go into the next slide, please. Thank you. So we can kind of look at open pedagogy as a single project and that is a great way to kind of get started and get your feet wet. It's not, um, you know, it does take a lot of work to come up with a single assignment or, you know, a single module or something like that, but it's not overly committing to a whole semester of open pedagogy assignments. So it's a great way to get started. Um, and this example, this is the Ontario Business Textbook Sprint. So basically some um, uh, faculty got together to do a one-time sprint to develop resources and to also learn different things. So I think coming out of this um, specific project link on this uh, slide is that they had resources for two business courses that came out of it. So you can still get a lot done within a setting, but um, it's not you know, an ongoing type of thing. So that might be a really great level if you don't have open pedagogy on your campus, maybe a single project. Um, again, you know, as I think as Michael and Will and some um, others in the chat have said, you know, there are a lot of faculty on our campus that are already doing this and identifying a single assignment or um, a project that faculty are already doing, maybe collaborating them is a great way to, um, to tie it to an OER program. And then the next one, sort of kind of scaffolding these a little bit, is looking at it as part of a pragmatic work. So over a semester, a number of assignments that are building on top of each other. So in this example, um, linked on this slide, if you have not seen this blog post, I highly recommend it. Um, <clears throat> as part of a biology course, students were asked to do different, read different articles, um, and apply those articles to their life and blog about it. And in this example, uh, one of the students shared their experience with open pedagogy and how kind of they grew um, from those assignments and um, their understanding of you know, open pedagogy and, and everything grew from that. So that's sort of a longer 
longer term project, a lot more work that goes into it. Um, and then the last step is kind of looking at it as a community of practice. So how to engage with your campus and your faculty and kind of <clears throat> create a, a situation where you have, um, in this example, the um, open pedagogy um, that well works with at NC State, they were a cohort of faculty and it provided an avenue of um, faculty support, um, also ways that they can collaborate together, ways that they can provide feedback, um, and then kind of also bring that to their own departments and build it out from there. So really building this community of practice that is continually evolving and continually growing. So those are kind of three ways to maybe think about how open pedagogy can be um, brought into an OER program. Obviously there's you know, very different levels as far as the kind of work that would go into it. Um, but if we focus a little bit more on how does that apply to the action plan? Um, so we've seen some examples in the chat also with what Michael and Will shared <clears throat> about how to apply this to your action plan. And, and I'll say like sort of as you're getting ready to or are writing your action plan, think about you know, the goals that you're setting up, your SMART goals, your timeline, are there pieces of open pedagogy that you could build into your plan? Um, all of us are on different levels with our OER program. Some of us are starting and some of us are, are more advanced. So how can you um, maybe take that to the next level or even to get started? Um, so for example, if you don't have open pedagogy on your campus, maybe just starting with the presentation, um, to faculty to start the conversation about what open pedagogy is, how they can use it, maybe highlighting some of the examples that we talked about today or even in the, in the chats that others um, have given are a great way to get started with it. Um, if you're already having those conversations, you know, looking back at um, helping and supporting faculty with individual projects or with multiple projects, multiple assignments, or even looking at how can you build a, a community of practice um, or support a community of practice on your campus? Um, so we'll follow up with that on the next slide and kind of just thinking about um, open pedagogy and how, you know, it's so tied to OER. It really, it really connects to the values of OER, um, but it can also be, you know, the kind of the next level, right? So if we're working with faculty on uh, awareness of OER, adopting OER, um, and eventually you want you may want to take your program to the next level. And what is that next level? So open pedagogy can be a great way to kind of take your program to the next step. Uh, and then I think, you know, um, Michael and Will have kind of highlighted this, that it really um, can connect to instructors with making, and even students, with making, um, you know, more engaging assignments. We've either lost Jeannie or lost me. I can't tell which one. I think it's Jeannie. Well, I think we've lost Jeannie. Okay. Well, I trust she'll be back in a minute. Um, but I, th I think she was doing a nice job of, of talking through the what we wanted to use the last 15 minutes or so to talk about is we've, we've talked about what open pedagogy is at a pretty high abstract level. We've talked about some specific concrete examples that we shared and in the chat you all have shared a ton of really incredible examples. So we wanted to take some minutes now to think about as you're doing the work of developing your action plan over the next month or two. Um, is, is there a place for open pedagogy in that work? And then uh, sort of what it's going to do for you, right? Open pedagogy could be a way to, to get people interested who might not have been interested in the past. Open pedagogy can be the next step. If you've had an, like a, a grant-based alt textbooky kind of program for a couple of years, how do we bring a different set of people in the door? Open pedagogy um, can be a tool for doing a lot of different things. So we, we wanted to invite you all to take a moment to think and then to share if you'd like uh, about sort of where could this open pedagogy stuff fit in the work that I'm going to be doing over the next year. And as I think about the specific SMART goals that I've articulated, how does open pedagogy help get us 
to those SMART goals. And maybe while you're thinking, I'll share an example. And Michael, think about if, if you might want to share an example as well. Um, so, so a comment, open pedagogy is important for indigenous communities to create indigenous language content. Absolutely. So open pedagogy as a way of improving existing open materials, right? That goes back to the open enabled pedagogy idea. It brings sort of the equity conversation in as well. But the, the studies out there on the representation of uh, people doing science in science textbooks, the quote, famous scientists from the past, or even just the picture of the person in the lab coat holding the beaker today. It's, you know, it's, it's all the things you would expect it to be. So I've seen great open pedagogy projects that are just about, let's take an existing resource and make it better in different ways. Let's see different examples. Let's just update the names that are used in different ways and that sort of thing. So open pedagogy as an invitation to give students the power to develop and share out better more invitational, representative, and equitable resources. That's a tremendously important and tremendously exciting way to think about open pedagogy. Thank you for sharing that example. Um, and then there's a question in the chat. Um, I said earlier in the thread, a theme we've heard in the Open Science Conference is as open as possible, as closed or necessary. And the question is, what does as closed as necessary mean? Um, somebody in the chat, it might've been Kyle, highlighted the sense that keeping student agency front and center in this process is really, really important. And for me, when I think about open pedagogy, that sense of, of giving people authentic agency is really the touchstone. That's really the heart of it. So an example of what is as closed as necessary mean um, there are a lot of cool open pedagogy projects that invite students to share in public ways like contributing to Wikipedia or posting on social media or that sort of thing. Um, students need to have the ability either to opt out of those things and or to be anonymous or pseudonymous as well. There are students who have really, really legitimate reasons for not wanting to put their name on a thing. Um, so saying open means it has to be your real name and your real face and it has to be open to everybody right away uh, is, is hugely problematic in a number of different ways. So, so closed in that sense. Um, we've all also, I suspect, had conversations with faculty, you know, do you want to use a CC BY license? Well, what about an NC license or what about a, you know, an SA license or that sort of thing? The, the reason Creative Commons has those different flavors of license is to give creators agency in how they share their stuff. This is a cool idea. I don't want some for-profit company to hoover it up and start selling it back to people. That's too open for me, or that's open in a way I don't like. So those are two examples where as open as possible, as closed as necessary might be relevant. I see Deanne has shared something as well. Open pedagogy is an avenue for innovation and empowerment for both students and faculty. Absolutely. So when you're talking to your administration and saying, why is OER cool? Why are we doing this work? Why should you support this work? Saying explicitly that stuff that you just said is really, really significant. Um, Jill says, I encourage students to share their work with each other and to learn to appreciate sharing for the good of the class without claiming precedence for authorship. That's a really interesting way into the conversation as well, is how do we think about what it means to be an author in different senses? So thank you for those examples that you've shared so far. Um, if there are other ways that you're thinking about incorporating open pedagogy into your work, feel free to share those. Or if you're in a situation where you're going like, it's been 45 minutes and I still have no idea what this means for me. This still feels really abstract and abstruse and like, I don't, I don't need anything that you've been talking about for the past 45 minutes. I'd be interested in that perspective as well. Um, maybe it's because you're really early in the process and it feels daunting um, or maybe, some other thing as well, but I'm, I'm interested in, in whether folks are finding stuff that's useful in here or not. I've been talking a lot, so I'm gonna to try to hush up for a minute. Well, I was actually going to bring in an example, a potential example. How could I include this in my plan? Well, what does open pedagogy mean? Uh, it may be something just as simple as, I need to have a discussion with uh, student leadership about what open pedagogy is. So they can start promoting this to students who can then start talking to their faculty and say, hey, I wanna participate in this way in this class. That could be one way. 
It could be a discussion simply that you have with faculty. I know in my cohort, there are people who are invited to the fall before fall faculty meeting. What an opportunity to throw in open pedagogy and talk about, you know, this concept, this is what it is. And these are some potential ways to, to include it. Uh, those types of things to include in a plan are excellent because it gives you a direction on how to start spreading the word about open pedagogy, which is a piece of OER. And it definitely uh, moves your program forward. Hey, I'm back. I'm so sorry. <laughs> My internet just totally completely died. Thank you, um, Michael, for and Will for taking over. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we've just been having a discussion about how this fits into different people's action plans and, and inviting people either to say, I, I really want to have a conversation about equity in OER or cost savings in OER or whatever, and OpenPED can help with that. Or the reverse, this all sounds interesting, but not really relevant to me. Um, and then just responding to comments in the chat and folks should feel free to unmute as well. So Jill, such an excellent question. How do I encourage students to use primary resources? Uh, so my, my personal suggestion, go talk to the special collections librarians. They, they have, first they have access to the content. They know what the content is there. Uh, on my campus, those librarians are always wanting to get primary materials into the students' hands, have them use them and participate in that. And what an opportunity, just taking it back to, uh, one of the examples, does a collection that you want them to participate with have a Wikipedia site? What an opportunity, if not, for them to look through these primary sources and give some sort of summary of the, this is what our library has and this is what it's about. But my, the biggest recommendation is talk to the librarians because they are really wanting to get, at least on my campus, to get these primary materials into the hands of students. That's a, a great point and gives me the chance to say the thing I always like to say, which is that this is such a team sport, right? There's no one person who can run an open ped program um, all by themselves. So, so open pedagogy work that brings in instructional designers, librarians, if you've got sort of digital distance, you know, those folks coming in as well. Um, but this is a space as much as any in OER where different perspectives and different voices and different skill sets and type of expertise really make it successful. And Beth, in response to yours, this is actually a great opportunity to talk to faculty about what open pedagogy is. And if you don't know what's happening on your campus, you don't know what faculty know about open pedagogy, that's a perfect goal. I want to find out what is happening on my campus and how I can help them take that next step, whatever it might be, toward openness and open pedagogy. And one of the things always, and I know you all do this, is to keep the students in mind. On my campus, constantly talking to the faculty, it's about the students, it's about the students, it's about the students. That it's so important that they understand it's not about how well you teach. How well you teach is about how well the students learn. Really good comments here. I, I, I like the note about um, bringing in uh, government documents librarians. That's a really important one as well. I'll, I'll say sort of a cousin to that are publicly available data sets, um, whether it's about climate change, whether it's about you know whatever, that can be data that is open in, in a lot of different ways and that's really important to use. Um, so I'll say that as well. And I've, I've loved the comments about we're pretty early in the process. So what, maybe what I can do is run a workshop or set up a LibGuide as well. I'll say, when I talk to faculty, we often use the term open interventions, which is to say, you don't have to flip your whole course right away to open. You can just post your syllabus openly on the web and students will have more agency when they engage with your class, when they select your class, et cetera. There are a million little tiny steps that you can take and say, I'm doing open pedagogy now in this relatively limited way. You don't have to like, you know, say, 
we're going to collaboratively design the syllabus and all the assignments are going to be open and we're going to work with WikiEDU and all that stuff. There are little ways to bring this, these values or, or dip your toe in the water with these tools. And interesting, Jill, you talk about you have few medieval resources. A lot of campuses are that way. Um, I recommend maybe talking to the special collections librarians or which campus has this kind of content. And if it's a local campus, can you get students to that campus to interact? If it's not a local campus, uh, can you get the materials digitized for this kind of a purpose? Uh, so many different ways that you could do it. And really in this particular case, it depends on context. But that, that's one way, because so many materials are being digitized, that's one way you can get them in the hands of the students. Yeah, sort of related to that, I've, I've seen some great work done in terms of institutional memory. So at my institution, we have a lot of folks who work in veterinary medicine and the Wikipedia sections on particularly uh, women in veterinary medicine are woefully small. So just going down the hall and knocking on the door, taking a perfect picture of that professor and writing up a bio of that professor, you have a new uh, section in Wikipedia that improves that information. The professor obviously is delighted to have their profile raised um, and students are doing that great important work as well. And then Jill, you raised the, the idea about translation as well. I, I could imagine finding a linguistics class or an upper level, upper level language class that is the work of translating that, right? Open pedagogy as a problem solver is another way into that as well. So that's a really, really good point. And thank you for that link, Sue. Um, Manisha, to your social work um, examples, I, I don't have any specific um, ideas on that, but um, and maybe Will and or Michael might. Um, but I think it was Megan who talked about the nursing um, nursing course that was doing developing like handouts that they would give to um, you know patients that they were seeing. That might be one one thing that um, could be like an open pedagogy type of thing for social work along those lines. Then also, just to point it out, Tanya put in uh, Matt DiCarlo working in there that the, these kinds of uh, communities that we're building here are so important for each of us as we move forward. Uh, we can reach out to these people and they'll just help. So be bold and just write to them and find out what happens. What, what is there to lose? Aaron, I love your questions about faculty doing community projects or service learning, but not necessarily with an open license. So I'll, I'll speak just for myself here and I will say, there are practices that I would describe as open pedagogy that do not result in openly licensed material. That to me, the distinction between an open educational resource and open pedagogical practices are an OER needs to be openly licensed for it to be an open resource, but a practice that centers student agency that asks deep questions about equity and representation, that, that does that sort of public serving work, I would, I would you know, if you want a, a, the gold star or the blue ribbon or whatever, I say you're doing open pedagogy and you should claim that and own that and, and say that loud and proud, whether or not an open license goes on. So Beth is asking about um, Wikipedia. Um, so this is this is a good question about sort of attitudes around Wikipedia and and maybe um, uncertainty about wiki editathons. Tell students not to use Wikipedia at all. Um, so yeah, it's it's possible then that that community or that at least those instructors are going to say I don't I don't trust that resource. And your response would be, oh, well, great, let's make it better together. And their response is, that sounds like too much work. I don't want to do that. That's totally OK, right? One of the reasons that we have, we have resisted saying open pedagogy is using this tool or doing this thing is it's going to be different, as, as I think um, Jeannie and Michael both said. So it, it could be that the wiki approach just doesn't resonate with those particular faculty members in that way. Uh, I will say that the wiki edu platform is really, really useful and powerful. That right hypothesis, you just kind of 
you install the, the um, application and you go. WikiEDU, they have this huge infrastructure that makes it really easy to do a lot of this work. So if, if you wanted to jump into the pond with a, with a partner who was gonna hold your hand a little bit, um, our experience with the WikiEDU platform was that there was a lot, a lot of both technical support and then people you can talk to as well to help you understand how do I do that editing work? How do I manage community guidelines and that kind of thing as well? Well, and, and Beth, maybe you know, let's make it better together does resonate for some of them as well. Um, and yeah, Jill says you can make wiki pages on your own. That's the one. Yes, Beth, thank you. That dashboard was, was really helpful. Thank you for sharing that link. I see we've got about three more minutes. So if there are other questions, feel free to ask them now. And if there are not, or if you're still thinking about them and you don't get them asked in the next couple of minutes, I will say the thing, the last thing I always say, oh, oh, I see a raised hand. Please, please jump in. Um, are there any sites we can go to for uh, a student agency or involvement student uh, requesting them to share? Because I work with a tribal college and sometimes the trust factor is there, um, not necessarily it's a lived experience or a residential school or um, you know, family um, story, because there's so much good uh, data they put in, in their sessions, uh, in their presentations, my students, and this is real good data, um, uh, which is not published anywhere, photos of their families, um, you know, real stories, which they have heard, or real songs. So student agency, uh, you know, whether it is closed as possible, where we, how can we assure them that we are not stealing your information and you, um, you know, you can keep it. Uh, are there sites um, for the student agency process of taking them, um, just like publishing, you know, where they sign a waiver, um, giving them the agency to pick up the license, uh, non-commercial or whichever they like um, for the work which they're doing? Because I think a lot of uh, work can be published, um, uh, especially indigenous, um, you know, indigenous content uh, in this manner. So are there sites where we have examples of, um, you know, student waivers or how to engage students or reassuring them case studies that XYZ um, has done this project and it's safe and it's okay? That's such a good question. Um, I'll say, I think there are some sites I don't have most of them at my fingertips. Uh, for the past year, I and uh, Lindsay Gum and Heather Maselli have been thinking a lot specifically about how to articulate the student agency in a syllabus, in a waiver, in a policy at the institutional level and all that kind of stuff. To me, that's one of the big gaps in our work right now is I think there are individual one-off examples of that, but I don't know of a central, like here, here's the, the toolkit for doing student agency well. Um, and I think part of that is that so much of it about it, so much of that is about the relationships, right? That there's no waiver I can give to somebody who doesn't trust me, that's gonna make them trust me. There's, there's no statement I can put in a syllabus that's gonna reassure a student who's been burned in the past that just because that language is in the syllabus, it's going to be okay. It's so much about entering into those conversations with respect and curiosity and, and taking the time to build up the relationship. So there are some resources that I'll try to find and share after the conversation, but, but at the end of the day, the relationships to, to me as a lawyer are more important than any legal document or policy document that's out there. Great question. Thank you, Will and Jeannie and Michael for this excellent session. Um, if somebody could send me the slide deck, a link to that, I'd appreciate it. And then I'll compile the materials and send out on our Google group if that's okay. So thank you all for joining us and have a great weekend. Thanks everybody. Thank you.